want to welcome World Affairs Council of America members from across the country because uh, this uh, meeting today is in collaboration with the World Affairs Council of America program uh, CXC, putting the world back together again. And also, of course, to thank uh, the Connecticut World Affairs Council chapter, uh, Council in um, Hartford for putting this idea together. Uh, I want to, a little bit of housekeeping to start. Uh, I'd ask you all to mute your computers. Um, I believe that we'll have that done also uh, uh, remotely, but if you could do that. And also you need to be aware that we are recording uh, this event. Um, we will host a Q&A session with our speaker, uh, and I will try to get to as many of your questions. So if you can uh, send us those through the chat or Q&A uh, uh, function on your computers. Uh, so now I want to introduce our speaker this evening, uh, Dr. Stephen Flynn. He is the founding director of the Resilience Institute at Northeastern University, uh, where he is a professor of political science. Uh, Steve has also been a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. And in 2008, he served as the lead Homeland Security Policy Advisor <coughs> for the presidential transition team for President Barack Obama. And Steve, I would love to hear the inside scoop on that someday. Uh, Steve holds uh, the MALD and PhD degrees from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University and a BS from the U.S. Coast Guard Academy. <clears throat> He's a co-author of a textbook um, on critical infrastructure resilience and author of uh, the book um, The Edge of Disaster and another uh, America the Vulnerable in 2004. And also interestingly, uh, Steve is a local here in Southeast Connecticut. He was, in fact, the founding executive director of Sec SECWAC's predecessor, uh, Southeast Committee on um, Foreign Relations, back in 1998. So I'm uh, particularly pleased to welcome Steve. The topic, um, which uh, has changed a little from when we talked back uh, last year about him speaking to SECWAC, but is still in the same general area, the topic is the role of resilience in dealing with COVID-19. Uh, so Steve, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Paul, and really uh, great to be with all of you. Uh, it's one of the surreal, of the many surreal things associated with the COVID-19 is this is the longest period of time that I've been in my home in Connecticut uh, since 1999, when we stood up the uh, Southeast Connecticut Council of Foreign Relations. At the time, I was a professor at uh, the U.S. Coast Guard Academy. Um, we, we fell in love with this part of the world, but I went off for a year to the Council on Foreign Relations, spent 10 years there, and then two years in Washington, D.C., and then now at Northeastern University in Boston. So I've, I've yet to figure out how to work in the same state I live in, but uh, 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 this is a nice opportunity uh, to be with all of you today and be you know, almost two months back to back here every day in old line. Um, it would be much nicer to do this in person, but um, what I thought I'd do here is uh, share with you a, a bit of what was framing my talk uh, at the outset uh, when I was invited to come here, which is to talk about the resilience imperative, but very much, of course, tie it to the thing that's in all our minds, which is the COVID-19 um, disaster, uh, emergency, uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, I think it's a, 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 a certainly a scale of event that's Pearl Harbor plus in a lot of ways. So, um, so to offer some thoughts about how we deal with this uh, through that resilience perspective. And, and by a bit of, you know, uh, biography to get me to this point here, I'll say at the outset that I, I, I came to the work that I'm doing uh, first as a Coast Guard officer uh, but then, uh, particularly in the late 1990s, I had the opportunity to serve on a U.S. Uh, 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 presidential commission that was set up at the end of the Clinton administration. It was co-chaired by former Senators Gary Hart and Warren Rudman, and it looked at the national security landscape in the late 1990s. And we rolled out a report in January 2001, where the primary finding was the number one national security challenge to confront the United States will be a catastrophic terrorist attack on our soil, for which we are woefully unprepared for dealing with. It was met with a collective yawn in Washington, D.C. in January 2001. Uh, but like the nation, my life changed after 9-11, uh, 
when, of course, that event became quite real. It was, of course, very frustrating to be in on a process where we identified the threat, made the case for preparedness, and saw very little being done. Uh, I was focused primarily on those national security-like issues during that time, but another light bulb went off for me when Katrina hit New Orleans uh, in 2005. I, I, I've said to myself, I can't come up with another national security challenge short of perhaps uh, a tactical nuclear weapon going off in New York that could destroy as much property, disrupt as much lives as this, national, as this natural disaster. And here again, we saw largely our federal government woefully unprepared for dealing with that emergency. At the same time, I've been looking at the issue of pandemic risk. I had a colleague at the Council of Foreign Relations named Laurie Garrett. Uh, Laurie was, uh, wrote a, a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, author and wrote a book called The Coming Plague back in uh, the late 90s and continued to look at this issue of risk associated with that. And so when I completed my book, The Edge of Disaster, uh, which was initially called Rebuilding a Resilience Nation. Uh, but my publisher, um, Hopper, uh, Collins said, or Random House rather, said there would be no way that they could sell a book called Rebuilding a Resilient Nation. So it was called The Edge of Disaster <laughs> uh, with a black and orange uh, cover. Uh, but in any event, the focus there in part was on the pandemic risk. And one of the things that I learned in doing the research there is again, that we were woefully unprepared for dealing with this kind of probable event um, and certainly consequential event. Uh, so it's a bit of a frustrating position to be in uh, yet again with a, you know, having both uh, analyzed the issues and offered up prescription for how to deal with that to see very little of that taken into account. Uh, but at this I want to be forward looking, not rearward looking. Uh, there's lots of reasons we could get into about why we tend to ignore things that we sometimes deem as low probability, even when the science will tell us that they're much higher probability and higher consequence than we're willing to acknowledge. But key to the effort here is to think about how we actually build a more resilient society, which we have the focus, the locus of the effort, I argue, has to be increasingly localized and engage civil society in a much deeper way than we've been doing today. And I would argue a legacy of the Cold War was the reliance on essentially a, a almost patriarchal, uh, top-down, we will protect you system that was, of course, necessary when we're dealing with the risk of thermonuclear war. Uh, that was a command and control, you know, a challenge that required, of course, the use of an arsenal that everyday people had virtually no role to play in. Outside of the civil defense role, which by the late, by the mid 60s really uh, started to wane. It was pretty much a, a, a social contract where we said the government will make us safe, we can shop and travel. Uh, what became clear with both the terrorism issue, but very much with the nature of the natural disasters that we're facing, including the pandemic one, is that doesn't work very well. As we saw with the, in fact, contagion hitting the, the USS Roosevelt, the aircraft carrier, the um, the Navy couldn't even protect itself from this particular pandemic, uh, never mind the rest of us. So what we're really dealing with here are risks that involve all of us, but which will require all our capacity uh, to actually manage more effectively. And we're still, I'm afraid, very much in this, well, let's look to those who are above us to take care of us. We'll comply with what we're told to do. Some of us are not even willing to do that. Uh, instead of really looking at, okay, right, what is it that we all have to do collectively to get out in front of these kinds of challenges? Because there are limits to what can be done at the national and even state level. So with that, I want to share my screen. I'll take you through just a few slides to shape out. The, really what I want to provide here was the, the lens which I bring to this problem. And this will take me about maybe uh, about 15 minutes. And then what I'm hoping is through your questions, I will flush out, I have a bit of what I observe on the COVID-19, but since uh, mid-March, I have been all COVID-19 all the time, and I'd be happy to get into a lot of that with you as well. But I think it's helpful to have a framework in a time where there's so much noise, it's very difficult to find a signal. So let me shift to that. Okay, can we all, can we all see what I've got here? All right, so we got the title slide here, and let me uh, 
So again, Mr. Kelly, I'm uh, the founding director of the Global Resilience Institute. It's a university-wide institute at Northeastern University. I have 120 faculty affiliates from all nine of our colleges. And we tackled this issue through a transdisciplinary perspective. And we were very much focused on solu uh, solutions. Uh, so let me take you to our, our first, um, let me uh, here. Okay, what is the definition of resilience? I have to begin with this one. We take uh, as our stepping off point, the one that was developed under the Obama administration that actually has still survived into this administration. The key here and all the colorful words here is resilience is something that is comprehensive and needs to be organic to how we approach risk. It requires us to think about being prepared for upcoming events. And when we are, when we're bit, when we are uh, coming back from an event, we don't just bounce back, we bounce forward. We adapt from the, to these events. We wanna be able to withstand essentially changing conditions. When engineers think about resilience, they think about designing structures and systems that can withstand a risk. If we think about a, a, a uh, structure built for an earthquake, it's a resilient structure if the ground moves and the system doesn't fail, if the building doesn't fail. It also, of course, deals with recovery and ideally rapid recovery from disruptions. The key here is you focus on disruptions, whether it's man-made or naturally occurring, whether it's fast moving or whether it's a slow moving like climate change, the core issue is disruptions require us to think in an ongoing basis, what's coming, how do we mitigate it, how do we prepare for it, should it happen, what is the acceptable point which we were willing to be able to be, to withstand the, uh, the threat, the shock as it comes, how do we plan for recovery, not just response to re recovery, and how do we adapt to it. Let me just, it's essentially the one piece here, planning for recovery relative to COVID-19. We shut things down uh, almost in a cascading way across the nation, and we had no plan for how to restart up. That's what is a core of now a very politicized, largely dialogue going on. If we could imagine, as we should have, that a pandemic would require us to essentially exercise social distancing, which would freeze our economy, you would think somebody would have had a plan, thought through, invented about what restart looks like, what recovery looks like, and how do you come back and do it in a way. But we are making it up in the crisis itself. And that's something that's anti-resilient, okay. So with that, what animates resilience, I offered as a core, it's captured by something that's not going on right now, but was going on right up through probably about the end of February. We have become hyper-connected. And why this is so important for us to acknowledge is because it's not that there is a more frequency of threat or hazard that I would argue that animates the resilience imperative. What is what really is animating that imperative is that we are hyper connected. So what used to be local now cascades in far more disruptive ways. Now this chart captures transportation flows, which again are largely frozen. Let me just give you one number. The current transit system here in Connecticut is operating at nine at, at five percent passengers. Uh, the current the throughput up in Hartford Airport is at three percent of its passengers from last year. So and even very locally, we know the disruption has come from the shelter in place. But the fact that we're hyper connected means that things like a uh, like a virus can move in ways far more quickly than historically have. There's always been disease outbreaks, but the speed at which it can be transmitted is because we're hyper-connected. We're also, of course, moving to where we're connecting everything from the Internet of Things. We're at 31 billion connected devices. We're doing this for great efficiencies, but what this translates into is potentially, if they're disrupted, it can cascade in ways that are far more complex and consequential than they were in the past. So let me give you an illustration of just a little bit why this is a challenge for us here. This busy sort of chart here captures what we call the interdependency challenge. No infrastructure sits all by itself. They were built off in that way. We wanted power back at the end of the 19th century. So somebody created a power substation and a generator and produced some power for the local people. Somebody needed water and you often had the water nearby you in order to access to that. But what we know now is that we've connected these systems in ways that they're interconnected 
and they were also much more sprawling than they used to be. I use the example of Boston. The only piece of infrastructure that the mayor of Boston, Marty Welch, controls is Boston sewage, the wastewater treatment plant in Deer Island, which you would fly over if you came into Logan Airport. He doesn't control the water supply. That happens in a reservoir that's 80 miles outside the city. He doesn't control the electricity that comes into the city. That's generated by Hydro-Quebec up in Canada. It, he doesn't control the transit system. It's run by the state and it services the entire region. So we have systems and that transit system is by the way is an electrical mechanical system. If I disrupt the power, I disrupt transportation. If I have no fuel, I can't provide a backup to a generator, which may be for a hospital or for a bank. So transportation, electricity, these are all interconnected. And so what used to be a local shock with actually nominal cost is now something that's far more interconnected. So in this case, we know that with COVID-19, with the impacts of social distancing and the risk of people getting sick who are critical to operating these systems, we can start to see system failures that cascades far beyond the public health emergency of associated with dealing with that dynamic. So as an illustration, we're actually been doing work in Puerto Rico, which in its almost two years after Hurricane Maria is still working on recovery. But this is a story of not a hurricane. Puerto Rico has been hit by hurricanes as long as it's been there. What made Maria so consequential wasn't even the scale of the hurricane. Puerto Rico has been hit by category four hurricanes before. It is that the hurricane toppled all the lifeline systems. It lost power through the entire island, which meant therefore that the water pumps couldn't operate. So it lost water. It, the port was disrupted. So there was no goods coming to the island. And even if you got to the port, you couldn't transport it out of the port because there was no fuel for the trucks to take the fuel to places. There was a backup power ran out quickly because you couldn't transport the fuel. All these things were connected. So it made it truly catastrophic. It wasn't that there was a hurricane. It is the systems that we rely on were built for efficiency, not for resilience. And when they failed, they failed very, very badly. So as a way to sort of give us a juxtaposition about how much we're in a different place today than we were 100 plus years ago, I use the example of Isaac Storm. This still today is the largest natural disaster for loss of life in US history. It was a hurricane that hit uh, Galveston Island in September 1900. It basically was a cat four. They had no warning. The highest point in Galveston at that time was eight feet above sea level. And the guesstimates are that the, sea, the storm surge was 16 feet. They had at least 8,000 people drown or disappear. They couldn't count them all. But here's the interesting part about it relative today. The rest of the country didn't even know this happened for 24 hours because the telegraph wires were knocked down. So the, if you were in Galveston Island, you were in trouble. If you're anywhere else, you were largely unaffected. That the fast forward to Hurricane Harvey hitting the Houston area. The loss of life was relatively small. The impacts were national and global because they take out Houston plus the Houston shipping channel. These cascading effects have real impact. And the challenge here is understanding these systems in advance, these dependencies and their consequence is key to animating the need to be prepared and for, for mitigating these risks ideally, but certainly recovering them post the event. So what's keeping us from becoming resilient? I've actually yet to find somebody who is against it. In our highly polarized time, there is nobody out there marching for fragility and brittleness. Uh, so I step back and I basically ask, okay, if something intuitively we know resilience is a good thing, you know, we admire it in people, right? We know somebody who's been knocked down by adversity and has come back. These are some of the best Hollywood sob stories. I mean, you know, we love these stories, the sea biscuit, you know, the horse that basically shouldn't win, right? Hit by adversity, bounces back. Well, what's keeping us from there? And suddenly we have identified and focused on our institute, five barriers, all which I would argue in play with COVID-19 in advance. The very first is risk illiteracy. I can't get you to prepare for a problem you think is never gonna happen. If you believe that a pandemic would never hit the US, and if it did, it would be like the flu, and uh, you don't really have to plan for these kinds of things. I can't get you to do anything else. If I can't get you to understand not just 
the nature of the risk, but how the risk will play out things that you value, then I'm not going to be able to get you to be resilient. The second is we don't design for resilience, we design for efficiency. In fact, our drive for efficiency has made systems less, uh, less resilient, it's made them more brittle. Because things like redundancy is seen as raising cost. And, basically, and, and hardening systems against risk, well, that raises cost too. We want efficiency. So think about what's happening with the meatpacking industry. We get a lot of farms all over the country. It's a very decentralized system actually, but it's concentrated in just a few packing meat houses where, that, where all of that pork and all that beef and all that chicken is processed. That's very efficient. Unfortunately, as it turns out, when you have a pandemic outbreak and workers can't work there, you disrupt the entire national system. Now there's still beef out there, there's still chickens out there, there's still pigs out there. We just can't get it to our grocery stores and ultimately to our dinner tables because we've concentrated the system so that it's fragile. And the efficiency therefore is it. So we need to design thinking about risk and that's often not where we've been at. The third one is, okay, even if we have designs, we don't actually adopt these designs because there aren't economic incentives for us to do this. That is, there are economic disincentives for us to do this. Without, without the uh, requirement or the benefit of essentially of investing here, these designs sit on a shelf. They don't actually get adopted. So we can know well what we should do, but we don't do it without the incentives. The other gets at this issue of interdependency. We're not organized to essentially deal with these issues of this complexity because by definition, the systems we're trying to deal with are cross-jurisdictional and they're interdependent and we're organized around jurisdictions, towns, cities, counties, states. Well, none of the systems we rely on fit within those boundaries. And then they're organized within them in the silos of transport versus energy versus as if they're not connected. You know, try getting bus people to talk to train people in the same city, right? They're not, we've got things siloed. So when you talk about this, the governance that allows people to see where things are connected, what they should be doing and prioritize is lost because as a legacy of how we built the system versus not how we use the system, we have essentially have a governance that's out of whack. And then lastly, we're not educating or training or engaging the next generation to operate this way. And this is why this has become very much a passion of mine and, and why I'm, I'm so thrilled to be at a university that's focusing on this. Okay, so let's look at how this plays out a bit in the uh, case for the pandemics. We want to overcome those barriers. Well, one of the things we would really be emphasizing, again, if we accepted that a pandemic risk is real, which we should have been, we would we really focus on public health education. We know there's basic 101s that people need to, in order for us to be successful managing a risk like this, it's all hands on deck. Again, civil society is key. So we'd have to have people understanding, hopefully before the crisis, why social distancing is necessary. I would prefer the term, by the way, physical distancing, because I want social connectedness. This is a legacy term, unfortunately, that actually works a bit against us. I want physical distancing, which is six plus feet, and I want social connectedness like we're doing right now, virtually. But in any event, we need people to understand why that's necessary. Why rearing a mask is so important, not because it's gonna protect you per se for the ones we're using, but it will protect everybody around us because the droplets that we potentially would sneeze or cough are gonna get caught and therefore not dispersed in the air and not likely to come in contact with somebody who's even three feet away. And but we're hopefully gonna say at least six plus. So if people understood those basics, then people would be having a mask and hopefully stepping forth and doing that. We need things like self-quarantining if you're sick. Again, people understanding what high-risk groups are, even if they feel uh, as a young person, maybe less vulnerable they would know, okay, there's a social role that I have to play here to, to actually. So public health education would be key. And this literacy, of course, should apply for all the virtual disasters you're likely to face. But there are one-on-ones that we should be providing folks that we didn't provide, and people were largely adrift when this pandemic broke out. All right, a second piece that we need critical to be resilient is this means to test. We can't bound risk if we don't have an idea where it is. And our inability as a nation in the failure over three months to really develop and mobilize an effective testing regime, unlike what's happened in Germany, is basically crippling our ability to manage this risk reasonably, I would argue. We're gonna basically open up the economy doing it blind. 
We're going to have hot spots and probably where the most vulnerable population are going to be impacted, perhaps fatally. We're going to do it just because we think the alternative of not doing it is too expensive and disruptive. And that's a debate, but there are things that we could do to manage that risk if we had adequate tests. And it's not just that test, though. So you need the supplies to actually execute the test. You also need the laboratories who can actually interpret the test results. And you've got to have contract tracing. And this is, this is over 100 years we know how to do this stuff. This is basic block and tackling. And yet we did not invest, nor are we investing, in the infrastructure that allows us to understand the risk and to manage the risk. We can still do it, but boy, we've been, we've been blowing this one. Okay, the, the core issue that we're wrestling with, I would argue right now, which has made our response so ineffective in a lot of ways is all disease management is local. You cannot manage a pandemic at the top. You have to have local public health. And because we have not faced major disease outbreak for a long time, for lots of short-sighted reasons, but we basically have decimated the public health system that always existed in this country throughout the 20th century at a local basis. So the people who are trained to do some of the things and understand the things that I just laid out here aren't there. Why is that so important? Because you want the local base in part to engage with the community, to understand and build the preparedness to basically include with companies in that community as well as the population, as well as the schools. This is an infrastructure you simply have to have and we decided we're not gonna invest in it anymore. All right, we should be funding that and it's not just the staff, it's the training, it's the planning and it's the community engagement that's key. And this is a trivial investment vis-a-vis -vis what we know we're facing now, but one in virtually all cases, states and communities have been cutting back significantly. A core issue that I'm actually trying to work right now in real time is this problem of just as I laid out of, with the case of infrastructure dependency is cross jurisdictional municipal networks need to be built to coordinate the planning, the sharing of data, the sharing of equipment and the building and sharing of best practices. The system we rely on now, which is a town identifies a problem, pushes up and New England we go right to the governor, uh, Connecticut we do, but most places go to a county to go to a governor, to go to the federal government. The federal government may come up with a solution to push it down to the state, to the county, to the community. This is so much time lag and is so ineffective when the front lines are literally at the community level. We live in a network world. We're having a conversation right now, all in our homes. We should find a way and develop a way where municipalities can truly coordinate with each other because they are on the front lines. They can be supportive of each other. The virus is not paying attention to jurisdictions. We need the ability for medium and small, medium-sized communities across New England to be able to communicate with each other, to be able to both understand data, what's going on, and also offer solutions. But we're using this very vertical process to get to where, which is not very effectively. And this is something I think is soluble, and, uh, but we, we have to think creatively and differently about it. It's the speed at which we, in fact, gather data and share it. This is something that the, the, the uh, uh, Department of Defense finally figured out in the war in Afghanistan. You have to essentially move to a more fusion structure that's horizontal and networked instead of hierarchical. It's too much lag time, too much data loss to do that. We have to empower municipalities to be able to operate with each other, not just in a vertical and uh, uh, along a vertical line. And then what's key here as well to build resilience in this pandemic is a pre-planning that's gonna be in place for the basics, again, that I laid out. You've gotta have the equipment, you've gotta have the tests. If you've, you've gotta have hospital beds, the ability to surge hospital beds, which we discovered we could do, and we knew this before, with dormitories that are now vacant or hotels that are now vacant. So you don't actually have to mix the population. If you have these plans in advance, these are reasonably cost issues, a lower, lower cost issue, is because you have sudden access in the pandemic to resources that you would not have had in the normal economy and now you're applying them. But that requires again planning in advance. And then we have to really be thinking about how we actually distribute the vaccine when we do it. It's a, there's some planning that would have to be done. Who gets it first? How does it get distributed? That's something that's going to have to be carried out locally. We can't just all be waiting here for somebody from the top of the mountain to hand down the tablets. So I'm getting this close here. Getting this resilience approach would be not something where we would have shepherd off 
We have emergency management planners who worry about the dark sky days. All the rest of us get to wear, you know, enjoy the blue sky days. And then we break class in time of emergency and they come out and they fix stuff. This is insane. This is reckless to believe that this is a way that we can operate. All of us at all levels have to begin to think about a resilience cycle. We have to be understanding risk and prepare for it. We have to do cost effective things to mitigate. We know we we'll have to respond when there's a shock. And when we recover, we should come back better and smarter. That adaptation feeds into preparedness, feeds into mitigation. It's an ongoing organic process of dealing with risk, not one that just waits for the who knew event. And then we try to make it up as we go along. I would argue that this has economic value and this tries to capture this here. We've done a lot more on this at my university about quantifying actually resilience. But this sort of captures the state, uh, the, the, the concepts here with this chart. So if you see on the left, an, a resilient system we one where what we're capturing here is function. So let's say mobility is a key function, right? We wanna move or communication like we're doing right now is key. Well, that function, when we have a shock or disruption, we lose for a period of time. And then we have to recover it. And the best of all situation is we would mitigate. So we don't actually lose that much function because we are prepared. The actual loss of function is, is small. And we have very capable response. So we come back quickly and we don't just go back to where we were before, we bounce forward. We actually have plans to build back better and smarter. We adapt, we come out in a better place, potentially with more function. Right now in the COVID, we should be thinking about broadband across the nation, like we thought about electricity in the 30s, not as something only a few well-off people can afford and get, or if you're in a dense urban area, but something that is, should be universal. We should be building that broadband capability. This crisis is telling us if you don't have it, you can't run schools remotely. You're underserving a population that's, in, in, that's most vulnerable. You're providing also limitations for how they can participate in the economy. We should be doing this in any event, but there's real value to doing it in a, in a disaster or pandemic outbreak. My second chart captures what we really has largely happened in most disasters are not like hurricanes and earthquakes. What we do is we don't actually do that much mitigation, but hoorah, we come back and we respond. And we usually put things back the way they were before. So if we had storm surge, wipes out houses, we rebuild the houses exactly where they were before, even though it's like to be another storm. All right, this other one is tells more of the story. The third one is the deep water horizon. We really didn't have a plan. We may have responded, but we can't recover because we don't have a plan. This is a lot of course what's going on here right now, where we're really trying to figure out what does recovery look like? In the absence of plan, you lose function for a long period of time. And I share last what most small communities, most medium sized communities and businesses look like, they don't actually come back. So the worst case scenario is that you are unprepared. So it is really consequential. You can't respond, so that takes a lot of time. And by the time you recover, you've lost so much. Your small businesses have disappeared, as we're seeing right now. They're not gonna come back. And so in that phase, you're not gonna be where you were before, and you can't get there from here. So I finish with this uh, as an illustration of what we're wrestling with. This actually captures a, a photo of the San Palos House on 36th Street, Mexico Beach, Florida. That was hit by, again, another Category 4 storm, Hurricane Michael. The only damage to this house was a rear window um, bathroom um, uh, window. They had, to, they had to redo the caulking on it. Around it, you see a slab. These are houses. They were formerly houses. In some cases, you can't even see the slab because the sand from the storm surge has covered the slab. This is an illustration of we actually know how to build for resilience. We just don't do it. And that's the key challenge. Why are we we're not adopting, embracing the standards? The cost of building a house this way is about 5% more than the cost of, of the houses that existed before this. And yet that cost, people were not willing, even building it on a waterfront, were not willing to take. So that's uh, this, oh, I guess I had one more here, I'm sorry. And this is part of what we're trying to do here. Our thing is think about every time we invest a dollar, a new dollar in something, we think about how we bake resilient into it. When we do economic development, regional planning, and, and when we bounce back, hopefully bounce forward from a hurricane or a pandemic, we think about how we invest those dollars to be in a better place. That again requires planning in advance, but we should not spend a single dollar in response to a disaster if we don't think about how we could come out of it stronger at the end of the day. We shouldn't be investing dollars up front in building new infrastructure, new systems, new technology, without thinking about embedding resilience into it. 
we have to make this organic, not to emergency managers, but to a way in which we function as an economy. So my conclusions are, first and foremost, when disasters strike, civil society is actually the most indispensable asset. And we've largely put them on the sidelines. We need to figure out how we make ourselves front and center. Resilience requires a deep understanding of hazards and risk at community and regional levels. We have to really start getting that literacy up. The goal should be to bake in resilience in the critical systems and, and functions as of the public and the private side. Large scale disasters, but unfortunately this is the exemplar, truly a global emergency disrupting, but increasingly virtually all major disasters are having regional, in some cases national consequence. And that means we all got to up our game. Even we're not in the crosshairs, like in Isaac Storm, if you're in Galveston, you're being impacted. So all of us have to get our game up to there. And increasingly, I would argue, and we're going to see this play out perhaps in the whatever economic recovery we ultimately come into, this is going to become a competitive issue. It, given that disruption is a fact of 21st century life, only those communities, those companies, and those nations that are resilient are going to be able to retain the people who have a choice of where they invest and live. We're going to be making decisions about where we live and operate based on how things are managed. We can't live in a risk-free place. So this is something we have to embrace, not as a woe is us, but as a key to competitiveness. And finally, to tie it back in, if we do this by building and by baking in or engaging rather civil society, what we're going to end up with is a place where you have stronger social capital, where we're less polemic, where we're more caring and compassionate. The focus on making us all involved in preparedness makes us understand why we come together as communities in the first place because there are things we can't do all by ourselves. There are things that we need neighbors, that we need our friends, and we need our community to help us with. We're, we've been survive, doing well as a species, surviving because we're social beings. And we need to figure out how we activate that again and get it out of the professional protectors and get us all into the process of building more resilient community, a more resilient nation, a more resilient world. So I'm gonna conclude there and hopefully flesh out some more uh, uh, things that you might be interested, particularly in respect to this crisis uh, in our Q&A. Well, Steve, thank you very much. That's, um, that's really a, a fascinating uh, tour de force of what it is, um, what resilience is, and thank you for giving us that background. We needed that, uh, and so we can now set the context. We do have some questions, and I'm going to read those. You think it's probably easier I do that. Um, so the first question, and I'll, I may, um, so the questioner uh, understands, I may edit a little. Uh, so Steve, as uh, founding director of the Institute, are you aware of the final report, Inspire to Serve, by the National Commission on Military, National and Public Service, and also a couple of uh, government acts, uh, the National Service Act, which will rapidly expand AmeriCorps to 250,000, but uh, according to the questioner, has no Republican support. Uh, that's what's written here. Uh, how, so the question is, how does your institute request thoughtful policy replies uh, from members of Congress on legislation and future hearings on it? So how, how do, you, do you interact with uh, um, uh, locally or with national legislations on these issues and how do you do that? Sure. Th th thanks for that. I'm a huge fan of public service and efforts to engage, you know, not just in military service, but like America Corps, getting your, our young people, giving the depression era level of unemployment that we're going to be facing. Uh, the idea we're not going to be thinking particularly for our young people and resurrecting these kinds of programs, I think is, is, is reckless reckless for their lives and a lost opportunity, you know, for our nation to engage uh, with those folks. So I'm hopeful about that legislation. I, I have a mixed record, I have to say, in terms of getting uh, people to pay attention to what I believe in, <laughs> as I laid out at the outset. Uh, I've testified, actually, my last trip to Washington, the last time I was on the road, maybe for a while, was uh, I was testifying before Congress on March the 10th. It was a bit surreal. I left Logan Airport, was the only person in the security line. There were 20 people on the plane. When I landed, the cab who picked me up uh, had been waiting two and a half hours to, for a passenger. And I went to Capitol Hill and was business as usual. Uh, there were people all running around and all this, and this is on March 11th. 
uh, that was my 31st time testifying before Congress and um, they're slow learners. Uh, but what we were doing here right now to impact on this is, is really get at both ends. I'm actually I'm very pleased to say I'm, I'm under uh, working uh, with a, a support from uh, FEMA Region 1, which covers the New England, to actually work with the states and the very first one turns out to be Connecticut, uh, where we're coming in and we're essentially going and looking at three what we'll call representative communities in each of the six New England states to, to interview and engage the public officials, the private sector leaders, and the nonprofit leaders about what they're seeing in real time and what they're projecting will happen if certain needs aren't met. The goal is to create needs assessments that actually can inform how disaster assistance or federal economic recovery assistance can flow. FEMA actually has a, a process for doing this. The key is it's a race for communities to organize themselves and states to organize themselves so they can plug and play into these assistance programs. The objective as well is to identify needs that we know are not going to be met by the existing uh, legislation, by CARES Act and other uh, efforts that are being put in place that can then feed into a second stimulus. But core why I left Washington DC and why I'm so thrilled to be where I am and the work I'm doing is I believe that you really got to get the data locally. You got to get it from the community, but you still have the mechanism to push it up vertically. But uh, if you can't, if you just sit there in the clouds as I was at the Council of Foreign Relations and talk about the big ideas, you're not likely to have much impact. And if you're just on the ground, you're not also likely to have much impact. But if you can create the connective tissue between the two, and we organize this around getting the state saying, I want you to pick three communities. In this case, they picked, uh, we just finished with Hamden. They're looking also at Norwalk and Hartford. Uh, we're working at Portland, Maine. The other states are just coming online. But our goal is, but we think pretty much 18 communities across New England will tell us a story about what is happening uh, across the region. And I'll highlight one, which is, you know, most of our communities, about 90% of the, of the funds that a mayor or, or uh, the town selectman has is non-discretionary. Uh, it's not, it's just locked in. It's, it's paying for contracts. Uh, it's paying for uh, workforce. And the, that 10 plus percent is largely supported by state through things like sales tax, which we know are not gonna be around. So these mayors are already saying they're terrified. You know, the only discretionary is to eliminate all services. Uh, and yet that problem really has not been addressed very quickly. I'll give you another one, uh, childcare centers. They virtually, none of them have a business model that has allowed them to basically be closed for two months. Most of their uh, payments often come in arrears. So they can't hire staff again to reopen because they simply have no cash to get started. So right now, 45% of the healthcare of the child care centers in the state are not right now reporting they're unlikely to be able to reopen, even if the state gives them permission to reopen. Well, how do we get young people to go back to the workforce if they can't have child care centers? So these are the kinds of problems that you see when you talk to the community that have to also inform the national policy. Okay, Steve. Um, another question, uh, in your opinion, what country or countries are best prepared for resiliency today? And, and I think it's quite interesting. I think I saw it yesterday on um, a plug for the PBS NewsHour. Uh, the two countries, I believe, with either the highest mortality or the highest rate of mor mortality are the United Kingdom and the United States, which is ironic beyond ir ir ironic. But anyway, um, what, what countries do you think are best prepared? Yeah, so what I need to say, one, one is, None of us are doing this great. Uh, this is something that every country is sort of wrestling with because again, a legacy we had of the 20th century was focus on efficiencies and cost and treating hazards as things that you just cope with when they happen. Uh, but one of the things that we stood up at our institute realizing that even if as a university wide effort, we're not likely to be as successful as we'd like to be, we formed a global resilience research network of institutes and universities uh, right now from 20 countries from around the world. So a lot of universities, some of them are approaching more as an engineering issue or a sustainability, heavy science or social science, bit mix, but we're trying to build basically a way in which we not only do interdisciplinary work, but work across multiple institutions that draw on expertise from various places. One thing I'll highlight is many times the less developed communities have some of the best resilience best practices because uh, they've had to develop those. And some of them can inform you, they're relatively low tech, and those are things that we could use. 
Right now on the COVID one, clearly two countries stand out. One is most like us, we should be, uh, have been able to emulate, which is Germany. They're doing the basic block and tackling. They, 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 they uh, surge test capacity. They're doing not just testing people who approach symptomatic, but they're building random tests in order to understand the scope of the problem. They've got the contact tracing. They've got the social contract or people buying into social distancing. And it looks like almost certainly going to start to be able to reopen. You can do this, but they're actually done the things that you should do to mitigate the risk. The other is New Zealand. Uh, it's done you know, a pretty superb job uh, with this. And New Zealand before this is very at, around earthquake uh, disasters. Uh, if you may remember the Christchurch disaster and so forth, they've made it organic again to how they operate. And just again, a simple trait, and this is not a less developed country. You know, you know, our West Coast is very, very um, at risk for a tsunami if you have an earthquake. And when you have a subduction zone break, which we will have, it'll create, you know, a monster wave and low lying areas are gonna be impacted. This of course is true in New Zealand as well. It's part of that sort of circle of fire earthquake era here. What school children have done as a project is they paint a line on the roadway in a colorful rainbow colors where if you're above that, you're safe for storm surge. So every time you drive and you see that colorful line, you know, okay, if I'm below this, I'm in trouble. If I'm above it, I'm okay. That's a very simple thing. It can be done as a school project. And yet it basically brings a culture of preparedness and awareness that's a key to be successful. So there's a lot we can learn from each other. Nobody's got this perfect. And of course, this is the key about reopening that hyperconnectedness. If some of us are really sloppy, like America is right now, and the Brits are not far behind, and some of us are really good, like the Germans, the German economy still depends on interacting with America. And so some good work can be offset, instead if we're not coordinating and collaborating with a common approach. <clears throat> Thanks, Steve. Sounds like uh, basic education um, would help a long way. Uh, I have another question from a retired clinical lab technician, and he or she is asking about um, uh, analytic data software for lab testing uh, supplies uh, processing data coordination, uh, basically how things are, and uh, AI uh, software, how, how these things are being um, addressed, if they are, to bring, I guess, uh, across, uh, across the country. And do we know if our leaders are making this coordination between different um, sources of this information possible? Uh, he, she has said they've reached out, uh, I guess, uh, on Twitter with no responses, but then that's Twitter. <laughs> which seems the way in which we govern now. So, uh, uh, but in any event, the, uh, unfortunately the answer is no, but here's what we're trying to do related to that. Uh, this is, he's spot on, and this is where, you know, we, there's so much, this is what excites me about the work that I able to do and the opportunity I have about uh, dealing with this. I, well, my, my tenure home as a political scientist, I spend most of my day with engineers, network scientists, and, and other scientists. Uh, network science is actually a powerful tool for us to understand the dependencies and interdependencies. Uh, my colleague, Alex Vesmignani, you probably read this just yet again in the paper here, was predicting to the day the amount of where the pandemic will hit based on modeling of, of travel patterns and where airplanes and where coming from, where they move, what the passion loads are, and what the frequency it has to do with. He was able to re-engineer and basically identify almost to the numbers of the actual numbers of people likely contaminated there. These are powerful tools that allow us to understand the connectedness. You know, the virus has to move. It moves by people. Where do the people move and how do they move? We can, we can build that together. And once we start to do that, we can start to then be predictive about where it's likely to go. But that requires a lot of, to understand a complex system. We need a lot of sensors. A challenge with sensors is they create a lot of data. Uh, data, though, can be managed through artificial intelligence. And we, we have now better tools to allow us to do this. I'll give you another example. Wildfire is a growing challenge that we're obviously facing the West Coast primarily, but we're not on the woods, literally on this one thing here, uh, in New England. Our, we've been reforcing ourselves uh, as a result of loss of all these farms. If you drove through Connecticut at the end of the Second World War, almost 80% of the state was treeless. Right now, we're almost close to 50%. And those trees are encroached on homes. Well, the reality, though, is we're going to have more droughts. 
that becomes Tinder, it puts, it puts us at risk. We know this playing out in California. Well, how, how do you deal with that risk though? A colleague of mine has developed uh, essentially through one of his laboratories, essentially a sensor that only wakes up if it sees a fire. It therefore has a 10 year battery life. It's like a smoke alarm that basically can sit and deploy as very low cost. The actual fire itself is what energizes it. It then registers the event and triggers the signal that allows you to give immediate notification of when a fire has happened. Again, that's a lot of data that will have to be interpreted. The bottom line here is this is not something that's just, you know, nuts and bolts. So there's some of that, the low tech things like painting the, you know, the line on the road where the tsunami is gonna look. We have powerful tools that we are not harnessing to bound this risk more effectively, to make intelligent cost benefit choices because largely the science is sitting on the sideline. It's not engaging, uh, dealing with the kinds of risks that we're facing. Right, trying to bring that uh, to the to the marketplace or to the public. Um, another question, and this probably will be the last, um, and it relates, I think, to um, uh, what you mentioned earlier about all disease management is local. A question, do you believe that regional health districts, such as Ledge Light, are effective as coordinators for municipal cooperation? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, in the case, again, we, we did lack county government here in Connecticut as in Massachusetts. You know, what we, we've evolved and I think so, is into a more regional approach because you know, our towns are really quite small. None of them can all build the same capacity. So this is something I know we've been wrestling with from a governance standpoint for a long time here uh, in New England. But clearly those regionals are, are, make sense when we're talking about knitting together, you know, a number of small towns in an area. You need to go to the locus of where that capability is, whether it exists in a, in a small city or a medium-sized city, or best in a more regional structure like that. That's a great place to learn. But the, the key is, I wrote a piece on Ebola when that broke out in 2014 for, uh, uh, for Politico, where I said, all Ebola is local. Where I was trying to highlight was that the way in which you manage the ultimate event, when people actually get infested, is, is a local capability. The CDC is largely a reference librarian. They don't write re research reports for you. You know, they can give you expertise. They can deal with very small numbers of things. But if we don't have capacity at the local level, as we're seeing, you can't manage these things very well at all. But it's not just for COVID-19. I would argue what we really are not paying attention as enough as we need to is the economic tsunami that our response, and our largely incompetent response to this has been and what it's likely to be. Let me give you another example. I know we're wrapping up here. The hospital in Martha's Vineyard has basically said, we can't afford to pay a hotspot. We just don't have the medical capacity to deal with that. So their recommendation is Martha's Vineyard shut down this summer. Well, how does all the businesses that operate on Martha's Vineyard, on Nantucket, on Block Island, but let's go for it. How does that work for any this tourist town that's built around Memorial Day to Labor Day? How's this gonna play out? There's a lot of unknowns here. And what we know is coming back is not gonna, it's not gonna be the same as where we were on March 1st. And so planning for this economic disruption, thinking much more carefully about what the workforce should be coming out of this. And we shared and talked about potentially, you know, mobilizing America Corps or other kinds of national service as a smart idea. This is a Pearl Harbor like moment that unfortunately didn't play out, you know, with the drama of wiping out the fleet you know, in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii on December 7th, 1941. It's been sort of a slow burn, but is as cataclysmic. And yet we're not mobilizing like we did in the Second World War, where we, we, we tap the power of civil society, where we engage the private sector, where all of us pulled in and played a role. This crisis warrants that, but most of us are sheltering in place waiting for somebody to hopefully come up with a plan that allows us to go back to our restaurants, get out on our beaches and go shopping again. And that is foolish and reckless. And all of you, I hope I have a chance to talk with, I hope you find ways, I'm sure you are, to work at the community level and have impact. We got to think our way through this and come out at a better place. Otherwise we're really in trouble. Well, Steve, thank you very much. That's really a, a wonderful way to finish up. And thank you for uh, the presentation. Um, I have to say that one of the comments you made uh, earlier about uh, we're very good at shutting things down but not uh, how to start things up again um, makes me think about uh, 
we're very good at going to war, but not necessarily dealing with the post-war situation. But we've seen that. And, and speaking of uh, us, the American public, uh, dealing with, um, with COVID-19, and uh, I, I, we also kind of forget that the country is also at war and has been at war, but for many of us, it's not even uh, relevant. We don't even recognize it. Um, so I want to uh, finish up with that. Um, again, thank you, Steve, for uh, your presentation. Normally, we would have a post-meeting dinner, uh, and we could grill <laughs> you over um, a glass of wine. We look forward to maybe doing that uh, later in the year or in 2021. Uh, I want to especially thank a few people, um, uh, the Chamber of Commerce of Eastern Connecticut and Courtney Assad, who's in the background, helping us with the technical logistics today. Uh, this would not have happened without uh, Courtney's uh, help. And I think um, this makes me think that uh, we will have more uh, SECWAC Zoom meetings. So please uh, keep an eye on SECWAC.org for future virtual meetings. Uh, thank you all for calling in, members and folks across the country. And uh, I bid you all well and ask you to stay safe and stay resilient. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you.